When Marcus Aurelius died in March 180, most people probably thought it would be business as usual. His son Commodus succeeded him, and most people likely thought he wouldn't live up to his father. But I don't think they considered just how far the apple fell from the tree. Commodus was every bit as vain, petty, violent, lustful, and selfish as his father was modest, forgiving, measured, temperate, selfless, and dutiful. Marcus Aurelius was an emperor who didn't want power, but who wielded it carefully and didn't give in to its temptations. Commodus reveled in his own power in a way Rome had not witnessed since Caligula's reign of terror. Where Marcus Aurelius detested bloodshed, rarely attending the games at the Colosseum and usually sparing gladiators when he had the chance, Commodus reveled in it. He loved rumors that his mother had slept with gladiators, and he fancied himself the bastard son of an arena champion. He often fought in rigged matches himself. He'd bring a razor-sharp blade while his opponents would be issued blunted weapons. Where his father listened to his council and the senate, Commodus actively ignored others, instead building a cult of personality around himself. Where his father was transparent and straightforward, diligent and humble, Commodus was a schemer, deceitful, lazy and arrogant. In short, Commodus wasn't even half the man his father was, and Rome suffered because of it. Marcus Aurelius did ensure that Rome's foreign threats were driven back, but his son's reign would strain the aging institutions of the empire that had stood since the days of Augustus from within. His father died while on campaign, in service to the empire. Commodus would die at the hands of an assassin, in a plot orchestrated by his political rivals and his own mistress. And in the wake of his death, Rome fell into a civil war that only ended when a military strongman sat on the throne. This is the story of a son rejecting his father's legacy, of an empire torn apart by a succession crisis and a rapidly changing world. And it all began where our last story ended, on the cold, dark Rhine-Danube frontier. We human beings are a funny bunch mixed up bundles of contradictions and spirit, as much angels as we are devils. And history is our story. It's the million little epic tales of which yours is a part. The actions of our ancestors echo in us. The good, the bad, and the in-between. The past may be a different country, and they may do things differently there. But as a country, we've all visited through the same human drama that has been played out millions of times over thousands of years. And if we know where we've been, then maybe we'll be able to see where we're going. This is Renegade Historian, and these are our stories. Marcus Aurelius was the first emperor in 82 years not to be succeeded by an adoptive son. Instead, the throne passed to his 18-year-old son and co-emperor, Commodus, who was the first emperor in Roman history who had been born to the throne. Since he was a child, he had known it was his destiny to rule the empire, and when he actually got that power, he didn't respect it. He took it for granted, and corruption was inevitable. He wasted no time in tearing down his father's legacy. Immediately after coming to power, he made peace with the Germans and returned to Rome. If there was one saving grace for the empire during Commodus's rule, it was that Marcus Aurelius and Lucius Verus had dealt enough damage to the Germans and the Persians that they wouldn't be a threat. As such, Commodus's reign was fairly peaceful. Now, the fact that he had done nothing to secure victory over the Germans didn't stop him from holding a triumph in October 180 in the slightest. 
He changed his name from Lucius Aelius Aurelius Commodus to Marcus Aurelius Antoninus Commodus and then turned over his responsibilities as emperor to a collection of friends, cronies, and allies. Chief among them was a Nicomedian freedman called Sauterus. That said, the corruption and scheming endemic in Commodus's reign can't be blamed entirely on him. His elder sisters and their husbands were all rivals to the teenage emperor, and orchestrated many a plot against their younger brother. The first was in 182, when Lucilla attempted to have her brother killed by two men who may have been her lovers. Marcus Umidius Quadratus Anianus and Appius Claudius Quintianus tried to do Commodus in as he entered a theater, but they messed up and were captured by his bodyguards. Both men were killed, and Lucilla was exiled to Capri, and later killed. Her husband, Pompeianus, who knew nothing of the plot, still retired from public life. One of Commodus's praetorians was in on it too, and his involvement wasn't discovered until after he had the opportunity to kill Soteris. The emperor was hit hard by his death, but he quickly replaced him with Sextus Tigidius Perennis, one of Soteris' own murderers. Commodus also took on a new chamberlain in Cleander, who was Soteris' other murderer, except for the traitorous Praetorian who had taken the fall for the both of them, of course. And that was just the first two years of Commodus' reign. After the attempt on his life, Commodus spent most of his time away from Rome. He was a natural athlete and left others to run the government while he raced horses and chariots and fought everything, animals, men, gods know what else. Marcus Aurelius liked philosophy. His son liked fighting. While the emperor frittered away his time, trouble brewed on the frontiers in Dacia and Britain. Both provinces were the wild and untamed far reaches of the empire. Dacia was the only province on the northern side of the Danube, while Britain was a cold, dark island on the edge of the known world. A number of future pretenders to the Roman throne waged small wars and schemed against one another out there. Clodius Albinus and Piscenius Niger in Dacia, and Ulpius Marcellus in Britain. Marcellus was replaced as governor of the island by a man called Pertinax, who will have a major role to play in this story. Meanwhile in Rome, Commodus continued to live it up as a party boy, while Cleander wielded the real power. He took full control over appointments to public offices and sold senatorial seats, governorships, you name it to the highest bidder. With brilliant leadership like that at the top, it's a wonder the empire began to destabilize. Large parts of the Gaul and Germania legions deserted and caused trouble in the provinces. Piscenius Niger dealt with the deserters in Gaul, but one of them, Maternus, a leader among the deserters, made his way to Rome in 187 to assassinate the emperor. His plan was to strike during the festival of the great goddess in March. Once again, March was not a good month for Roman politicians. But Maternus was betrayed and executed. Later that year, Pertinax stopped another conspiracy against the emperor led by Antistius Burrus, who was one of Commodus's own brothers-in-law. The emperor retreated even further from the public eye to his countryside pleasure palaces. Meanwhile, Cleander made another power grab. He deposed the head of the Praetorian Guard and appointed himself to the position. He gave himself a fancy new title too, Pugione, or Dagger Bearer. Nothing ominous about that, not at all. With his new position of power to protect him, Cleander continued selling public offices until 190, when he had appointed 25 suffect consuls more than there had ever been in the history of the office. One of those appointed was Septimus Severus, a North African with a very big part to play in the future of the empire. Anyway, the political corruption gravy train is a great ride until it isn't.
In 190, Rome suffered a food shortage. The guy actually in charge of the grain supply was Papirius Dionysius, and he didn't want to take the heat. The Romans had a stomach for corruption, but if you messed with the grain supply, the response from the mob was swift and often lethal. So he managed to lay the blame on the already unpopular Cleander. The mob protested against him during a race at the Circus Maximus in June. He sent the Praetorians to put them down, but was countered by Pertinax, now the city prefect of Rome. He dispatched the Vigiles Urbani, sort of a Roman police force and fire department all rolled into one, to resist them. Cleander saw that the situation had gotten out of his control, and he ran to Commodus for protection. But Cleander greatly overestimated how important he was to the ever-mercurial emperor. At the urging of his mistress, Marcia, Commodus had Cleander executed, along with his son, Julius Julianus, the Praetorian prefect, his own cousin, Anna Fundiana Faustina, and another of his brothers-in-law, Mamertinus. Commodus now took more control over the government. He, I guess, had decided enough was enough. He changed his name back to Lucius Aelius Aurelius Commodus, and he had technically been in power for about ten years, but better late than never, I suppose. He also picked up a new chamberlain called Eclectus and replaced Julius Julianus with Quintus Aemilius Laetus as his new Praetorian prefect. And it was here that his reign really went off the rails. Commodus began portraying himself as a god, specifically Hercules, much to the chagrin of the Senate. He put up statues across the empire of himself with the aspects of Hercules. He was as physically powerful as his father was intelligent, and was very proud of his good looks and athleticism. He went so far as to fight in the arena, charging the people of Rome a million sesterces for each appearance. His opponents always surrendered, so he had a perfect win-loss record. He never killed them, not publicly, but he had a habit of killing them later during practice matches. But that was pretty far from the worst of it. He also liked to bring in a bunch of people who'd lost their feet and have them tied together so he could club them to death while pretending they were giants. But what he loved most were the animals. He loved fighting and killing animals. Cassius Dio tells us that he once killed a hundred lions in a single day. In another instance, Commodus killed three elephants. He also killed an ostrich and a giraffe, too. Dick moves, all. His actions in the arena speak volumes about his character, but then again, so do his actions outside it. Commodus wanted to remake Rome in his image. So when a fire swept through the city in 191, he decided it needed more him. He renamed it Colonia Lucia Ania Commodiana, and renamed all 12 months to each of the 12 names he'd given himself. He renamed the legions Commodianae, the Senate was renamed to the Commodian Fortunate Senate, and Romans themselves were to be called Commodianus. He was cultivating a cult of personality. He had made himself out to be the beating heart of Rome, its life, its religion, and its empire. He went so far as to deface the Colossus of Nero, replacing its face with his own, and adding a club and bronze lion to portray himself as Hercules. Real tasteful, you know? He continued being an upstanding leader into 192 when, during the plebeian games in November, he killed animals with javelins every morning and fought as a gladiator every afternoon, obviously winning each and every time. As you can imagine, this sort of thing ruffled more than a few feathers. His own Praetorian prefect and chamberlain, Laetus and Eclectus, planned to kill Commodus that December. They managed to get his mistress Marcia on their side because she found her name on a list of people Commodus planned to do away with. She poisoned the emperor's food on December 31st, 192. 
but the poison had expired and just made him really sick. It looked like he was going to pull through and be really pissed when he felt better. As he vomited, Marcia, Eclectus, and Laeta sent Narcissus, Commodus's wrestling partner, to strangle him, which he did, and the Senate immediately declared the late Emperor a public enemy and undid all of his egomaniacal renaming. He was the last of the Nerva Antonine Emperors, arguably Rome's best dynasty, as it was the family of all five of the good emperors. Sad that it would end on such a bum note. But it was time for a new dynasty to rule the empire. Pertinax was the immediate successor to Commodus and was confirmed by the Senate, but it would not be Pertinax's dynasty that would rule. His reign lasted just three months. He was immediately suspected of foul play in Commodus's untimely demise. But what did him in was that he made the mistake of trying to reform the Praetorian Guard, and they killed him for it. They were supposed to be the Emperor's protectors, but they had just plunged Rome into a year of chaos and hastened the collapse of the Roman Empire of old. Buckle up, it's about to get confusing. In a perfect symbol of how corrupt Rome had become, the Praetorian Guard auctioned off the throne, and one idiot... Didius Julianus was dumb enough to buy it. He briefly succeeded Pertinax, but was accused of being responsible for Pertinax's murder. The three nearest generals to Rome used the illegitimate means that Didius Julianus had used to procure the throne as an excuse to launch their own bids for power. This is where Septimus Severus comes in. He was closest to Rome, and as he approached the city, a soldier assassinated Julianus, and Septimus Severus took the city. But the people who liked Julianus reached out to Piscinius Niger, who also made a bid for the throne. After Septimus Severus took the city, Piscinius Niger used his allies in the eastern part of the empire to fight Septimus for the next two years. Clodius Albinus was the last of the five emperors. He was in control of Britain in 193 and was actually offered the throne when Commodus died, but turned it down. He was an enemy of Septimus Severus, but agreed to a treaty with him that gave Albinus control of Gaul and Hispania, along with the title of Caesar, in exchange for helping Septimus fight Piscinius. Once Piscinius was defeated, Albinus continued on in his role as Caesar for a little while, but ultimately he and Severus fought a civil war for three years that Severus won, leaving him the last emperor standing. When the dust finally settled from the year of the five emperors, Rome was left with a different kind of emperor for a different kind of empire. The Pax Romana was well and truly shattered. Severus was capable and competent, but lacked Marcus Aurelius's vision and wisdom. He was autocratic, crude, and egotistical, but also very shrewd and politically savvy. Born in Leptis Magna in modern-day western Libya, Septimus was an ethnic North African, perhaps descended from the Punic peoples who had come to the region from the Middle East or the Berbers native to North Africa. His mother, Faustina Paia, was likely of Italian origin, descended from a group of Romans who had come to the area and intermarried with the locals. Septimus Severus's ancestors spoke Punic, and the language was still in use in Roman Africa, to the point where it affected his accent. Still, like Marcus Aurelius, it didn't much matter to Septimus Severus, or to the people of Rome, that his family was from the outer provinces, rather than Italy. He was as Roman as his predecessors in outlook, in culture, and in language. He also had something that was rare for Roman emperors, a lifelong friend and right-hand man that he could actually trust, for a little while at least. Now Marcus Aurelius had a good relationship with Lucius Verus, but I don't think he trusted him. He would have been foolish to. Septimus Severus, however, had a boyhood friend called Gaius Fulvius Plautianus. Their relationship was a bit more like Augustus and Agrippa, but Plautianus had a bit more ambition than Agrippa. 
we'll get to that. Septimus Severus was well-educated for the day, but he didn't continue his education past age 17. He was a man of few words, but many ideas, in the words of Cassius Dio. A man of action, not of thought. Blunt and energetic. Some called him ruthless and a liar, but he preferred to think of himself as ambitious. Where Marcus Aurelius had had an interest in philosophy, Septimus Severus had an interest in the law. What's more, he was a pretty good lawyer by all accounts. He once managed to defend himself in court against charges of adultery, but that's a whole different story, from a time before he met his wife, Julia Domna, a noble woman from Roman Syria. Like Septimus, her family was native to her home region. They spoke Aramaic, Latin, and sometimes Greek, but looked at themselves as Romans. The two married in 185, and were very much in love with each other, by all accounts. They had two sons together, and Julia would be great for Septimus's political career. Because, unlike Marcus Aurelius and Faustina, both Septimus Severus and Julia Domna were politically savvy schemers. Julia was also an intellectual. She kept a circle of philosophers, mathematicians, and jurists around just to talk ideas with them. But enough about who Septimus Severus was. What did he do, exactly? Well, when Septimus Severus executed Clodius, his wife, and his sons in early 197, the last loose end from the year of the five emperors was tied up, and he could return to Rome as its victorious sole emperor. Immediately it became clear that his relationship with the Senate would be very different from Marcus Aurelius's. He executed 29 senators who had shown support to his enemies in the Civil War. Throughout his reign, he would kill 10 other senators that we know of. He liked the warriors from Rome's past, like Augustus and Sulla, and he made that very clear. The Senate wasn't the only organization that he punished, though. The Praetorian Guard had played a large part in the chaos that had ripped Rome apart they had to be dealt with. Severus executed hundreds of Praetorian guards and replaced the traditionally Italian guardsmen with foreign-born recruits. The old Roman aristocracy looked at the new guards as little more than barbarian savages, but they were loyal to the emperor, and there were a lot of them. Septimus Severus also doubled the size of the guard and the firemen, and he tripled the size of the police force. He also had a camp built for his legions just south of Rome, tripling the men near the capital from 11,500 to 30,000 men. For Septimus Severus, there was to be no division between the army and the state. But his reforms didn't stop there. The army hadn't really been reformed since the days of Augustus and sorely needed some attention. First, he gave the legion a pay raise but debased the currency to do it. Both Marcus Aurelius and Commodus had done the same, and Rome would have to pay for it in the future. For now, though, it worked. He also allowed soldiers to marry. They had done so regardless, of course, but now they could get hitched without worrying about violating army regulations. Septimus also expanded the size of the army by creating three new legions. He used his shiny new Roman army to expand the empire. He was one of the last emperors to make a concerted effort to expand Roman territory. Rome was a superpower that was in the process of switching from an offensive to a defensive footing, and he sought to restore Rome to her glory days under Augustus. In many ways, he was a tin pot dictator. Brash, bloodthirsty, and without so much as a fuck to give. Speaking of how few fucks he had to give, Septimus Severus also adopted himself, something nobody had ever done before, but he was the law as far as he was concerned. So yeah, in 195 he adopted himself as Marcus Aurelius's son. 
Senate be damned, he legally made himself Marcus Aurelius's son and Commodus's brother. In addition, he made his son Caracalla a Caesar and changed his name to Marcus Aurelius Antoninus. Septimus also deified Commodus, which pissed off a lot of people, but not the military. Commodus had raised their pay, so they were a-okay with that move. Most Romans accepted the adoption as well. They were nothing if not pragmatic, and peace, even under a strong man like Septimus, was what they wanted after the chaos of a civil war. So, with peace secured in the capital, Septimus made moves against Rome's enemies. Parthia had invaded the empire while Rome was embroiled in civil war. Septimus Severus could not let that stand. In 197, he set out to fight the Persians, and within a year, he had sacked Ctesiphon and annexed parts of northern Mesopotamia, naming them after the province that had been founded by Trajan, which once stretched from eastern Turkey to the Persian Gulf, and coincidentally was also called Mesopotamia. It wasn't as big as it used to be, but the province was a colossal propaganda victory for the emperor. He had taken Ctesiphon on the anniversary of Trajan's ascension to the throne on January 28, 98 AD. He took the opportunity to name Caracalla as his co-emperor, but his victory in 198 showed that this was a very different empire. The new province stretched Rome's resources to the breaking point, and Septimus Severus had to spend four years settling things in his new province. He finally returned to Rome in 202. The emperor's health was failing him, but he still turned right back around to go on a tour of his home province and city in North Africa. He spent lavishly building Lepsis into the jewel of the North African coast. He built numerous monuments and statues that still stand to this day. When the imperial family returned to Rome in 203, Septimus Severus launched a building program and held numerous festivals. The most prominent building project was a new triumphal arch devoted to himself and his son Caracalla. He built it right near Augustus's triumphal arch in another attempt to link himself with his predecessor. But aside from self-aggrandizement, Septimus Severus also rebuilt several temples and other buildings that had been destroyed in a fire and expanded the imperial palace. He also held games in 204, celebrating another century of the glorious empire, and declared Rome the most holy city, which is kind of funny given the city's religious history moving forward. But all was not well behind the scenes. The emperor's right-hand man and boyhood friend, Plautianus, had slowly been building his own aspirations to the throne. He'd made powerful friends, and as prefect of the Praetorian Guard, he was in a position to cause a lot of trouble. In 202, he married his daughter to Caracalla, and began making plans to usurp the throne altogether. But as so often happens in situations like this, Plautianus overplayed his hand. People talked about his ambition. He put up more statues of himself than Septimus, and in 205 it backfired. Caracalla, then 16, successfully accused Plautianus of conspiring to kill the emperor. He had Plautianus executed on January 22, 205. He then divorced his wife and exiled her to a remote island. Caracalla didn't mess around, as his brother Geta would later learn. Plautianus and Caracalla's wife were erased from public structures and statues. Their faces were marred beyond recognition or otherwise resculpted. And Caracalla would soon get a taste of real power. In 208, Severus took the whole family to Britain with the aim of conquering the peoples north of Hadrian's Wall. But much like the Germans, these Celts refused to fight the Romans on their own terms. The tribes beyond the wall were elusive, using hit-and-run tactics to wear the Romans down every time Septimus Severus advanced beyond the safety of the wall. Domna came with him every time as the mother of the camp, and his sons aided him in command. But by 211, his life was catching up with him. 
Tired, stricken with gout, and disappointed in his failures in capturing Scotland, the Emperor died on February 4th, 211, in Eberachum, modern-day York. He was about as far from home as a Roman Emperor could have been. The sunny shores of the North African coast, likely a distant memory, under the steel-gray skies of chilly northern Britain. He was buried in Hadrian's tomb, his ashes resting with another of Rome's greatest rulers. The throne passed to his sons, Caracalla and Geta, but sibling rivalry didn't even begin to describe the relationship between those two. Their relationship immediately became even more antagonistic than it had been. After making peace with the Caledonians, they spent the entire trip back to Rome arguing, and they even considered dividing the empire between them, but their mother persuaded them not to. She did her best to keep her sons from killing one another. But on December 26th to 11, at a meeting Julia Domna had arranged to reconcile her sons, Caracalla had his brother assassinated by the Praetorian Guard, and then launched into a purge of all of Geta's supporters. Caracalla had his brother's likeness systematically removed from all statues, frescoes, paintings, everything. All coins bearing Geta's image were melted down. His name was struck from all records, and it became a capital offense to speak or write his name. And all 20,000 people were executed on such charges. And after a violent act of fratricide like that, what did Caracalla do? Well, he went on to construct the second largest bath complex in Rome, which still bears his name today. I've been to them, and they really are beautiful, some of the best surviving baths in the city. While his building projects were nice, he also debased the currency severely. When his father died, Roman denarius were 55% silver. By the end of Caracalla's reign, it had been reduced to 51%. People began hoarding older coins with higher silver content, which caused inflation to worsen significantly. Caracalla introduced a 52% silver coin called the Antonianus, which was meant to be a double denarius, but it was really only worth 1.5 denarii. He then used this debased currency to give the Legion a pay raise, ensuring their loyalty. Turns out, the Money Printer Go Burr meme is a lot older than we all thought. But the most significant of Caracalla's decisions while in Rome was the 212 Constitutio Antoniana, or the Edict of Caracalla, which extended Roman citizenship to all free men in the empire's borders. The expansion of citizenship had two functions for Caracalla. One, it extended taxation to all those new Roman citizens, boosting the state's revenue. Two, it gave Caracalla a lot of support in the provinces, which were becoming increasingly critical to Rome's security and prosperity. After the whirlwind of activity that followed Caracalla's purging of his brother, the emperor left Rome in 213. He would never return. He first went to the Rhine frontier and waged a successful campaign against the Germanic tribes there, namely the Alemanni Confederation, which had broken through the border and raided Roman territory. They were mostly subdued by 214, and he reinforced the border fortifications to keep them that way. While he was away at war, Julia Domna became an integral part of Caracalla's administration. He hated the day-to-day -day aspects of ruling, and let his mother handle a lot of them. Most critically, receiving petitions from the people and answering correspondence. Even so, the final legal authority rested in Caracalla, so she had to get the actual decisions from him. After the campaign in Germany, Caracalla went on a tour of the provinces and developed an obsession with Alexander the Great which may have inspired his decision in 216 to go to war with Parthia. That year, he aggressively attacked Parthia's borderlands with Rome, and offered the emperor a proposal of marriage between himself and Artabanus V's daughter. The Parthian emperor unsurprisingly refused, and Caracalla used it as an excuse to invade. The emperor launched attacks on the Tigris countryside, 
in the spring and then returned to Edessa in modern-day southeast Turkey in the winter to prepare for the next campaign. While he was there, in early 217, the emperor briefly stopped to have a pee when he was approached and stabbed by a disgruntled legionary who had been passed up for promotion to Centurion. With the emperor lying dead in a pool of his own blood and urine, a man called Macrinus, the praetorian prefect, declared himself emperor with the backing of the Roman army. The senate soon confirmed him as emperor, but he refused to go to Rome, which turned the city against him. It wasn't by choice, though. He had much larger problems to deal with in the east. Caracalla had left the empire's treasury empty, and there was an ongoing war with Parthia. Macrinus did manage to bring an end to that, and then he began trying to implement monetary reforms. He tried to revalue the currency, boosting the silver purity of Roman denarii to 57% by the end of his reign. He also reduced the pay for new recruits in the Roman army, and that's where things went wrong for him. The veterans in the army turned against the new emperor, foreseeing the reduction of their own pay and privileges. Meanwhile, Julia Domna plotted against Macrinus. She planned to use the military sentiment to her advantage, but she was found out and put under house arrest in Antioch. At the time, she was dying of breast cancer, and soon she passed. But there was another, Julia Domna's sister, Julia Mesa. She set her son Elagablus up as a rival to Macrinus, claiming he was Caracalla's bastard. Mind you, she was the late emperor's aunt, so that would have been beyond creepy. Still, on May 16th, 217, Legio III Gallica proclaimed the boy as emperor, and he, quote-unquote, led a revolt. Realistically, at 14, he was largely under the control of his mother. Macrinus fled and tried to reach Rome, but was captured in Chalcedon and executed. His head was sent to Elagabalus, and the Senate proclaimed the teenager emperor, which went about as well as you might expect. Elagabalus did what any 14-year-old would do with access to unlimited amounts of money and power, and things got weird. He had sex with dozens of men and women, he took four wives, including one Vestal Virgin, which was a sacrilege, mind you, and he lavished gifts on his lovers. He might also have prostituted himself, and that's not even going into his religious weirdness. He pissed everybody off, including the Praetorian Guard. Sensing the waning support for her son, Julia Mesa turned to her daughter, Julia Avita Mamea, and her son, the 14-year-old Severus Alexander. The boy quickly became favored by the Praetorians, and Elagabalus made numerous attempts on his life. But on March 11th, 222, again, March, the Praetorians killed the 18-year-old emperor, and most of his associates and lovers were also killed. His policies were immediately repealed, and Severus Alexander was proclaimed emperor. After the chaos of Caracalla, Macrinus, and Elagabalus, Rome was eager for some peace and stability, but at the start of the teenager's reign, it seemed Severus Alexander wouldn't be able to bring any. Rome faced incursions from both Parthia and the Germanic tribes. The empire's finances were in shambles, and the people were pissed off. Understandably so. And here was the youngest emperor in Roman history up to that point. But, over the thirteen years of his reign, Severus Alexander would prove to be the best of his dynasty since Septimus Severus himself. With his mother's help, Severus appointed a number of jurists to rehabilitate a justice system run roughshod over by a succession of tyrants. He also instituted a new council to assist the urban prefect in the capital and refurbished many buildings in the city, including the Baths of Nero. He also successfully restored the Roman currency. Its purity had fallen to just 43% silver by the time he came to the throne, but in 229 he revalued it and boosted it to 50.5% silver. 
He also lowered taxes, which encouraged the development of literature and art, and he opened loan offices to allow Roman citizens easier access to credit. I've said it once, I'll say it again. Rome was very ahead of its time. Its economy is far closer to a modern nation's than pretty much anything before its time or for centuries after its fall. But Severus did more than nurse the economy back to health. He also attempted to integrate the growing Christian minority into Roman life by building a temple to Jesus in the capital. However, Rome's pagan priests persuaded him not to. He did manage to get a synagogue built in Rome, though. Finally, he expanded the rights of soldiers, allowing them to name anyone as their heir. Ordinarily, there were strict laws around that, but now soldiers had more freedom. A young recruit could send what money he did have back to a mother or father, even a sibling, if he was killed. The property rights of soldiers were reinforced as well. In all, the kid was doing a great job. Until the Persians invaded, under the command of Ardashir I in 231. They quickly overran Mesopotamia and then pressed on into Syria and Cappadocia. The Roman army was beaten back in several battles. When the young emperor showed up, he launched a three-pronged invasion of Persia from Antioch, which didn't go well. The southern thrust through Babylon was surrounded and slaughtered by Persian horse archers. The central force, led by Severus Alexander himself, retreated after a number of indecisive battles. The northern force did well in mountainous Armenia, where the Persians couldn't use their superior cavalry. But once winter set in, they took severe losses due to attrition. The generals commanding those legions had not set up the necessary supply lines. Rome's armies had become undisciplined and ineffective. The world-famous discipline and logistics that had made the Roman army the world's finest military machine were a thing of the past. The Persians had been checked, but the outcome of the war was indecisive. Neither side had gained anything, but they'd both lost men, and money, and a bit of their pride. To make matters worse for Severus, the army began rebelling. The Syrian legion proclaimed a man called Torinus emperor in 232, but Severus managed to put that revolt down and came back to Rome triumphant in 233. The next year... Germanic barbarians broke through the Rhine frontier and burned border towns to the ground. The army, already demoralized by their poor performance in Persia, began to turn against Severus. The emperor rode north to meet the Germans, but when the mere presence of the Roman army didn't deter the raiders, he turned to bribery at the behest of his mother and tried paying the Germans to leave. That was the last straw for the disgruntled army. Legio XXII Primigena assassinated Severus and his mother at Moguntiacum, modern-day Mainz, Germany, on March 19, 235. Gonna say it again, March is a bad month for Roman rulers. The Severan dynasty died with Severus Alexander, and he was replaced by a man called Maximinus Thrax. But, in killing Severus Alexander... Those legionaries came very close to causing the complete collapse of the Roman Empire. The crisis of the 3rd century had begun, and it would shake Rome to her very foundations. The Roman Empire that emerged on the other end of the crisis was very different from the state that Augustus had created. But that's a story for next time. Until then, this is Renegade Historian, signing off. Have a great day, everybody.